Welcome, this is module number four from our series on constrained optimization. This one presents an introduction to duality. It's pretty short, probably only about 10 minutes long. I was gonna combine this with the next module, number five, which actually deals with Lagrange duality itself. However, that one's pretty long, probably closer to an hour. So this one provides an introduction to the theory, the derivation, and the examples that we're gonna look at in the next. Uh, the concept of a duality principle refers to many abstractions within the field of math, science, and engineering. Now, why am I going through all of these? Because when I was learning about the duality principle, oftentimes I was confused um, with regard to what we were talking about, right? Because the term duality, uh, dual relationships, is used in so many different areas. So I thought what I would do is quickly go over some of the uses of the term, although only one, the last one, is really of interest to us here. One use is in the area of tensors or linear algebra, where we see that every primal vector space has its associated dual covector space. We actually cover this, uh, the topic of primal and dual spaces, in our series on tensors, our series of modules on tensors. So if you're interested in that, you can go to my YouTube page and find the appropriate playlist. Okay, next is projective geometry, where we see a duality exists between points and lines. Projective geometry theorems represent dual forms by interchanging those two points and lines. In set theory, duality, a duality principle, the duality principle can manifest in the relationship between unions and intersections. And in category theory, duality is a fundamental concept where structures and morphisms can be flipped. For example, limits and their colimits. So one thing you can see here is that this term duality or duality principle uh, refers to similar relationships that are reflected in many different areas. I don't know too much about these three areas, so I'm not going to say too much more about it. However, let's get down to what we are interested in, which is the duality principle and how it applies to optimization. In linear programming, or really any linear or nonlinear constraint optimization problem, um, we see that every primal problem, every primal representation, has its associated dual problem or dual representation. And like I said, this is the focus here. Perhaps this sentence doesn't have any meaning to you yet. Hopefully it will have a meaning by the end of this module and definitely by the end of the next. So let's try to explain what that sentence meant. Let's visualize an optimization problem and we're tasked with minimizing some objective function f of x with respect to some inequality constraints h of x uh, that are less than or equal to zero. And we're going to refer to this as our primal problem and this is pretty much the only type of problem that we have been looking at so far. We may think of this as the most intuitive or natural representation of that problem. It also facilitates the most direct approach to solving it. The variable to be optimized, x, is called the decision variable and we're going to start calling it the primal variable or the primal decision variable and this will contrast to the dual variables which is a term we're going to use to refer to lambda and mu which we were also calling previously calling the lagrange multipliers now this primal representation may be difficult to solve sometimes we've already seen a couple reasons why in modules one through three and we're going to see some more reasons later on so how do we generate an alternative? How do we generate a dual problem, a dual form, a dual representation? In essence, what we're going to do is reverse the order in which optimization is applied to the primal and dual variables, aka the decision variables x, as well as the Lagrange multipliers lambda and mu. Previously, we performed both of these in parallel, right? If you Recall back to module number one, when we were applying the method of Lagrange multipliers, we really didn't separate when we were looking for extrema with respect to the decision variables x or lambda, right? What we did was we calculated the gradient of the Lagrangian with respect to both at once, and then we solved. When we got into addressing inequality constraints, right, then we brought in the kirushkun tucker conditions, and those presented this process in a slightly different way. For example, instead of calculating dl d lambda, which in turn is equal to the equality constraint, what we ended up doing was just including that equality constraint as the primal feasibility condition. And then we also had some additional complementary slackness, etc. So, but the main point in modules one through three, we never really separated out when we were optimizing with respect to the primal or the dual variables. We were considering it all as one package. Now that's gonna change in the next module. In the next module number five, we're gonna break it down in a much more granular level, granular level, where you're going to see that there is actually an order in which we apply optimization with respect to the primal and the dual variables. Okay, so we've talked about this term, dual variables. Let's define it a little bit more formally, right? The dual variables, which is really the same thing as the Lagrange multipliers, represent a gradient-like, slope-like relationship between our object objective function, f of x, and the relaxing or tightening of our inequality constraints, h of x. And when we say relaxing or tightening, what we're talking about is decreasing or increasing the related thresholds. These gradients, 
allow us to prioritize constraints according to their importance or relevance to the optimal solution, which I'm going to refer to as XOPT. Now, there's two types. There's two categories here. We have active or binding constraints, and this is one that has reached its threshold uh, when X is optimal. Okay, and for that case, H of X would be equal to zero. Let's look at a very quick example. Let's say we have some H of X, all right? And then that's equal to some amount of energy that we're using. I'm gonna call that E of X, right? Some function of X minus E maximum is equal or should be le less than or equal to zero. All right, so this constraint is satisfied. Let's say this has a value of 100, okay? When this value is 80, what we end up with is a value of negative 20, which is less than or equal to zero. This would actually be the case of an inactive or non-binding constraint. This will be the case where h of x is less than zero. However, how would we adapt this to become a binding constraint? A binding constraint would be the case where e of x is 100, right? It's reached its threshold. Therefore, 100 minus 100 equals zero, and that is the situation here. So the difference between the active binding constraint and the inactive or non-binding non constraint is a very practical one and one that's pretty easy to understand. But if we think about it in terms of something like this energy constraint example, an active constraint is one that has reached the threshold. It represents a actually an equality constraint, right? Because at that point, the inequality becomes inequality, whereas the inactive or non-binding constraint remains an inequality. Now, as you might assume, these are really more important, okay? to the final solution because they have a real tangible effect on the optimal solution, whereas the non-binding, the inactive constraints are less important. And so that's what we mean when we say up above that we're gonna prioritize the constraints according to their importance, with the active or binding constraints being more important and the inactive or non-binding constraints being less important. Now we use these gradients, okay, which are the Lagrange multipliers, between f of x and the active constraints to increase optimality. Again, remember, the active constraints are going to be the more important ones. And they tell us how to increase the optimization by moving or shifting these constraints. So you can see here, there's a little bit of a hint of what we're talking about. The dual problem, instead of us moving the decision variables, what we're actually going to be doing is moving the dual variables and adjusting how the constraints, especially the active constraints, affect the optimal solution. So there's two types of duality. I don't know if we've discussed this term yet specifically. Um, there's two types of duality and what duality refers to is the relationship between the solution that we would generate by solving the primal problem and the solution that we would generate from solving the dual problem. Okay, so strong duality exists when the solution to the dual problem, which I'm going to call x dual OPT, is equal to that of the primal problem exactly. All right, so if this is equal to this, then we have a case of strong duality. And this means that we may move constraints such that only the most optimal solution remains. Next, we have the case of weak duality, which hopefully you can already sort of predict what that's going to be, right? We're gonna take this equality and make it unequal. All right, exists when the solution to the dual problem represents merely the lower bound to that of the primal. Now, when we talk about solution here, we're actually not talking about X. What we're actually talking about is F of X. So what I should say here is that F of X dual OPT is less than or equal to F of X. Now up here, it was okay for me to use X interchangeably with F of X because th this, this should still hold. So what this means, the case of weak duality, is that we may reduce the feasible solution space, but not to the single most optimal point. The duality gap is the distance between the primal and the dual solutions. This gap equals zero for strong duality by definition, right? So here we have the duality gap would be defined as duality gap. And right, for strong duality, this equals zero. For weak duality, uh, this would be greater than uh, greater than zero. And this is uh, an absolute value because the duality gap doesn't have a sign. So quick summary, a couple clarifications before we jump into the next module. Um, the next one is going to help us gain a better understanding of duality. I know this is a very, very brief overview, but it's really just meant to be an appetizer before you dive into module number five. The dual problem is an alternative representation of the primal constraint optimization problem that we discussed previously in modules one through three. It defines at least, at worst, right, a lower bound for F of the optimal solution. Okay, for strong duality or best case, they could be equal. 
This bound may equal the optimal solution for strong duality. Duality may represent the upper bound by flipping the appropriate signs, but we're largely going to neglect this. Like most things in these constrained optimization problems, we can flip signs however we want as long as we maintain consistency. But in order to make this easier, we're really going to focus, at least for now, on minimization problems where h of x is less than or equal to zero, and we're going to be defining duality such that it provides a lower bound. The most fundamental change to the problem, going from primal to dual representation, is the reversal of order in which the optimization is applied to the primal and the dual variables. I know that may not really have a strong meaning now, but hopefully it will by the end of module number five. It allows us to redefine the optimization problem in terms of the dual variables. And that's another main difference between the primal and the dual representation, right? In the primal representation, we're focused on solving for x. In the dual representation, we're focused on solving for um, mu and lambda. It transforms the minimization problem into a maximization problem, which is interesting. We'll see that in module number five, and it can be advantageous for certain problem types and applications, and that's another thing that we are going to dive into. So the next module uh, addresses Lagrange duality. I apologize that in the YouTube video, which I've already actually made that one, this is uh, incorrectly listed as module number four, but it is actually number five. So hopefully this provides a nice introduction to that one, and I hope you'll check that out next.